I am pleased to um, start a section on the microbiology of clinical development. Uh, we have three great speakers lined up for that. Um, don't scare anyone away. It won't be uh, all micro. But this is the stuff that's my bread and butter, and I think many of us in this room, understanding the pathogens, understanding what we need in clinical trials, and understanding the testing at the back end. So first, we have Erica Matushik. She is the director of the UCAS Development Laboratory. She's been integral, I think, in development of every new antibiotic to date she's had her hands in, as well as all the old ones as well, confirming what we know about how to test it versus what historically has been done. Um, there's, so I guess we'll start with that. Thank you, Erica. Thank you. Uh, I would like also to thank the organizers for inviting me to give this talk. Uh, as Judith already said, I work at UCOST Development Laboratory. These are my disclosures. Uh, and I will start with a very brief summary of what we do at the UCOST Development Laboratory. We are located in Växjö in Sweden, and our main task is to develop and maintain UCOST methods. We work with both the disk diffusion test, but also with broth microdilution methods. Um, we develop criteria for new antimicrobial agents in collaboration with the pharmaceutical companies, but we also do a lot of work to validate our other breakpoints to provoke the system and make sure that they work, function as well as they should. We evaluate AST materials from different manufacturers. We do a lot of supportive work to clinical laboratories using our methods. And we organize courses and educations. And we also coordinate a network of laboratories with which we collaborate when we develop and uh, uh, validate our methods. So in vitro testing, the basis for all in vitro testing, I would say, is standardization. We have to standardize the parameters to get reproducible and reliable results. So we standardize the potency of the antimicrobial agent, and when we do disk diffusion, also the disk potency. We standardize the media, the type of media, supplements, pH, and also agar depth for disk diffusion tests, and the size of the inoculum, incubation, both time and atmosphere, and also the reading of the results. Reading of results is difficult to standardize, but it's not impossible. So the gold standard for any antimicrobial susceptibility testing is broth microdilution MIC testing. And there is an international standard on this that we have agreed on. Uh, the standard covers rapidly growing aerobic bacteria, so it doesn't cover everything that we test. This standard is also currently under revision, and there will be a revised version published next year. Uh, the major differences will be that it will be more generic. So for example, QZ ranges that is included in the current standards will be removed, and the standard will um, recommend or adhere to, um, sorry, refer to CLSI and UCOST latest guidelines for that. But there will also be some other updates and clarifications. So this is the reference method for broth microdilution, unsupplemented millihinton broth, a standardized inoculum, standardized incubation, uh, time and atmosphere, and also the reading. So the standardized reading is, or the um, main recommendation for reading results is to read the MIC as the lowest concentration of the agent that completely inhibits growth. So this is what we try to do for most agents and most organisms that we test. But sometimes we have to modify the, the method to get reproducible results. And here are a few examples from the ISO standard where we have to modify the broth. Sometimes we have to add something. For adaptomycin, for example, we have to add calcium to get reproducible results. For uh, tigacycline, it must be tested in freshly prepared broth to reduce the oxygen content, which would otherwise affect the MICs. Lipoglycopeptides must have a polysorbate 80 in, added to the broth, and cephidrocol, a new cephalosporin agent, has to be tested in iron-depleted millihinton broth. 
But as I said, most agents can be tested with the standard recommendations. There are also some special test situations where the organism doesn't grow well enough in the unsupplemented broth. Uh, streptococcus species is included in the ISO standard with an addition of lysed horse blood to the media, but no other fastidious organisms are covered. And those will probably not be covered by the revised version either. So again, it will be referred to you CLSI and you cost recommendations for those. Um, for Haemophilus influenzae, CLSI and UCOST uh, recommends different media, the CLSI, the Haemophilus test medium, and we recommend the MHF broth, which is millihinton broth with 5% lysed horse blood and 20 milligrams per liter beta NAD. And that's equivalent to our solid media for fastidious organisms. It's always also important to note that we recommend the MHF media for most fastidious organisms, all that we can recommend it for, uh, including streptococci. And that has been an important aim when we have developed both disc diffusion and broth microdilution methods to have common me media for fastidious organisms and not be uh, having to have one media for streptococci and another one for Haemophilus. In some occasions, we also have to have specific reading instructions. And the most well-known example is the sulfonamides and trimetoprim, where you should read not the complete inhibition of growth, but an 80% inhibition of growth. This is included in the ISO standard. But there are also now newer agents where we have to have more specific reading instructions to get the correct results and reproducible results. It's not uncommon that this is related to trailing endpoints. Uh, and again, this is probably not be covered by the ISO standard, but, re but referred to CLSI and UCOST. This is from the CLSI uh, broth dilution guideline M07, which, where there are very nice, uh, nicely described how to read and also pictures showing where to read the MIC. Uh, this example is for trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole, where you should read at 80% inhibition. And another example for linazolid, where you should read the MIC at the first spot where trailing begins, and just ignore very tiny buttons of growth or pinpoint growth. And this is not exactly the same as the 80% inhibition rule. And I think that this shows that it's very important that we have clear instructions and that we have pictures to show how these should be read. So far, uh, we have only published a reading guide for the disc diffusion test on the UCOST website, but we will add also reading instructions for MIC testing. We don't have a specific guide uh, published to describe the birth microdilution test. We only refer to the ISO standard, but by using the UCOST MH MHF media for fastidious organisms. So during drug development, you have to do MIC testing. But first, you have to define the reference methodology. And that must be done before you can produce any MIC distributions and before you can do, perform potency determinations. So you have to investigate, are there any special test situations? Do we have to add supplements? Is it necessary with specific reading instructions? And again, this is, should only be recommended if it's absolutely necessary. As much as possible, we will, should st stick to the standard recommendations. If you test fastidious organisms, you must be aware that there is a difference between CLSI and UCOST recommendations for media. And also, if you test an agent inhibitor combination, everything gets much more complicated. I won't talk much about this, but you will have to decide should it be a ratio or a fixed concentration of the inhibitor, what should the concentration be, etc. And before you do any clinical trials, you have to establish QC ranges. Otherwise, you cannot perform reliable testing and you cannot detect resistance. And if we don't have that, we will put patients at risk. So when you have established a reference methodology and you have your QC ranges, you can start to do MIC testing to produce wild type MIC distributions. And those are used to define target organisms and also to identify the wild type isolates and isolates that are non-wild type and isolates with known resistance mechanisms. 
This is an example for Ceftobiprol. Uh, this is from the UCOS MIC database. Um, and the blue bars correspond to isolates that belong to the wild type population, and the white bars are non wild type. So, those kind of data is necessary to determine the microbiolo microbiological activity. And in this case, it's obvious that we also have to look at important resistance mechanisms since the MIC distributions differ for the MSSAs uh, compared to the MRSAs. I will talk a little bit more about how we develop quality control criteria and zone diameter breakpoints. Um, CLSI has a guide called the M23 describing these procedures, and we have an SOP available on the UCOS website describing the UCOS procedures. Many of our procedures are similar or equivalent, but there are also some important differences, and I will try to highlight those. So when you start with um, developing a disk diffusion test, you first have to select the disk potency. So you would, um, we work to find the optimal zone size. And one aspect of it is that it should be a reasonable size, a reasonable zone size. You, won't, you don't want to have too large zones. Uh, it should be reasonable small zones, but you should still be able to separate out the resistant isolates from the ones that are susceptible. Um, and of course, one reason for not having too large zones is just that you can put more disks on a plate and still read the inhibition zones. But most importantly, we perform parallel testing of disk diffusion and broth microdilution, MIC testing, and correlate those two. And we look at the different disk potencies, how well can they separate wild type from non-wild type isolates, and how well can they predict susceptibility and resistance. This is an example from a UCOST study, and we usually present our MIC zone diameter correlation data like this. We produce an inhibition zone diameter distribution, and then the different colors of the bar correspond to different MIC values. And the green bars here correspond to susceptible MICs, orange and red to resistant, and the yellow ones are intermediate. And in this graph, you can see this is uh, actual data for an agent, a five microgram disk. This is Staphorius. We have a nice wild type over here with the susceptible isolates. The resistant ones are well separated from the wild type, and those are the intermediate ones that we also can separate out. In the same study, we looked at a 20 microgram disk as well. Um, and here you can see, I don't know if you can see it, but I can tell you that the yellow ones are now moved into the wild type. They are no longer separated out. And also the resistant ones have moved much closer to the wild type. So in this data set, we would go for the 5 microgram disk since it better separates the resistant isolates and it can separate the intermediate from the susceptible ones. I think that you all are aware that there are some differences in the disk potencies between the CLSI and your cost recommendations. And this is the list of the ones that are um, published and are different at this point. But there are also a number of new drugs that are developed with different disk potencies. The reason for this is that we um, analyze the data differently and we have some different recommendations on uh, how to select the disk potency. But this is something that we are discussing and we are having discussions with CLSI, trying to find out is this something that we can streamline and have a common recommendation for. So we will see where that leads. It's also important to select relevant QC strains. We have to do quality control, both during clinical trials and everything, and all the in vitro testing that can, will be done in the laboratories. And this is, of course, valid for both MIC testing and disk diffusion. So the strains should represent target organisms. They should have on-scale MIC values, optimized inhibition zone sizes, and if you have 
a beta-lactam beta-lactamase inhibitor combination, you also need to include a resistant strain to control the inhibitor component. And for some other agents, it might, might be necessary to have a resistant strain as well. But of course, we try to use the standard set of strains as much as possible. This is just a brief summary of how we perform the QC studies. This is valid for both MIC testing and disk diffusion. Um, CLSI does one multi-lab study with seven labs. Um, and we do it a little bit differently because we start with an initial two lab study where we include a bit more variation in materials. Uh, and then we set a tentative range from that data and we validate that data at additional laboratories included in our network. Um, but as you can see, both CLSI and UCOS, we have quite similar recommendations that we have to test media and disks from more than one manufacturer. This is an example of a CLSI data analysis. Um, the data is presented per laboratory or testing site, per disk manufacturer, per media manufacturer, and the differences in between are uh, evaluated. The analysis is mainly performed by Gavin Statistics, which is based on median values and standard deviation. And there is a recommendation in the M23 guide that ideally at more than or equal to 95% of the data should be included in the range. We do a similar data analysis. We also look at the median values. We look at mean values from the tests, uh, what, between which zone diameters do the results range. Um, data is analyzed per testing site, per disk manufacturer, per media manufacturer. And we also, I think, put more emphasis into the distribution and the shape of the distribution. So this is an example of a result from a study that we did. Uh, the graph to the left from the initial two site study with the different labs in different colors. And this is from the validation study that was performed at five additional clinical laboratories. Uh, this data looks exceptionally good. It's not always this straightforward, but it is, it is live data. Um, and in this case, the data from the initial study and the validation study complied very, very well. If they don't comply, or if we have results from one media, one disk deviating from the others, uh, we look into that. And I think that our analysis is a little bit more flexible, so we can decide how to deal with outliers, uh, depending on what the data looks like. But the CLSI is a bit more um, stringent described in the M23 how to deal with this. Also, we usually try to keep the range as small as possible, because if you want to have a good quality control of your test, you cannot have a very wide range, because then you can have all kinds of different variation and still be within the range. Another difference between UCOS and CLSI is that we publish not only the range, but also a target value. And this is a part of the UCOS QC tables. We have a range, both for MIC and zone diameter quality control. And the range is used to allow for occasional variation. We cannot get the same, exact same result every time we test. So we have to allow for some day-to-day -day variation and some reasonable variation between disks and media from different manufacturers. But what we should aim at be, is being close to the target value. So the target is the middle of the range. And when you do repeat measurements, your mean value should optimally be on the target value plus minus one millimeter. Then you will know that you have a very well calibrated test. And from our routine laboratory that we are located next to, we can say that it's not at all possible when you look over time to reach this for most agent strain combinations. So now we have decided on a reference MIC method. We have QC criteria for both MIC and disk diffusion, and we can move on to establish zone diameter breakpoints. And this is done by correlating inhibition zone diameters to corresponding MIC values, and sometimes also to defined resistance mechanisms. But MIC is usually our main reference 
So the graph to the left here shows, this is data from a study that we actually did together, CLSI and UCAST, to develop the pefloxacin screening test for fluoroquinolone resistance in salmonella. And the graph to the left shows all the aggregated data correlating to ciprofloxacin MIC. So the green bars here are, correspond to MICs that are susceptible for ciprofloxacin. These are resistant. And as you can see, we have tested quite a few resistant isolates, but we still have a, very, a quite nice separation between the two. And this graph, it's the same data, but the colors of the bars now correspond to different fluoroquinolone resistance mechanisms, with the black bars being isolates without resistance mechanisms. There is one quite a major difference between the US and the European market in when and how we develop zone diameter breakpoints. So in the USA, the MIC and zone diameter breakpoints are developed in parallel, and all this is included in the data submitted to FDA and CLSI. But in Europe, the zone diameter breakpoints are established after the MIC breakpoints are set, and the disk diffusion data is not included uh, in the package that is submitted to EMA and UCOST when it comes to clinical breakpoints. And there is another SOP on the UCOST website that describes exactly how UCOST clinical MIC breakpoints are set. So when we do this, we of course have to define which isolates shall we include in the study. And there are some minor differences here between Zelisa and UCOS, but it's quite similar. Um, you should have around 100 isolates per relevant species. There must be wild type isolates included, isolates with relevant resistance mechanisms for the agent in question, of course, and for the drug class, maybe. And you need also isolates with MICs close to the breakpoint. But it's not that easy to put together this very good, perfect uh, collection to establish zone diameter breakpoints. And I think that this picture illustrates that. This is not real data. I have just made these ones up. Um, again, the same si type of presentation. And the graph over to the right here, we can see that we have a very nice normal distribution here for the wild type and the susceptible isolates. We have something here that is probably low level resistant and something that is more high level resistant. And if the data looks like this, it's not that difficult to find a good zone diameter breakpoint that will correlate with the MIC breakpoint. But sometimes it could look like this. And here we have top loaded with many, many difficult isolates, a lot of isolates close to the breakpoint and with just low level resistance, which is fine. But when we analyze the data, we have to be aware that this will affect the results a lot if we look at a data set like this or like this. And I think that maybe the best option is something in between. We have to provoke the system, but we also have to uh, be aware of that we're working with a provoked collection. So how we set up these studies, that varies a bit between CLSI and UCOST. Um, in, so far, there are no re uh, specifications in the CLSI guidelines on the number of media or disk manufacturers or testing sites to be included in those studies. Uh, we have specified that it must be media from at least two manufacturers, the discs from at least two manufacturers. We do the basic MIC zone diameter correlation work at one or two laboratories, which are well-trained and skilled. And then again, we do a validation study where we involve our network laboratories so, to help us to validate the criteria that we establish. And I think that it's extremely important to be able to show that this method is robust when we put materials from different manufacturers into it. That's what we do with the QC ranges, so I think we must do it also when we do the zone diameter breakpoints. This is an example of the CLSI data analysis, which is based on the error rate bounded method, also described in the M23 guideline. Uh, and basically, basically, you can say that the zone diameter interpretive criteria are adjusted and modulated to minimize the number of false susceptible results, which is the same as very major discrepancies. This, we want to avoid that. Uh, but also to minimize the number of false resistant results, which is major discrepancies. And it's 
allowed to have a higher level of minor discrepancies, which includes any discrepancy uh, with an intermediate result. But I would like to, and then there are of course levels of the percentage of very major discrepancies and major discrepancies that are acceptable for a zone diameter breakpoint. But again, I would like to stress that how we put together the isolate collection will greatly affect the results. So we can modify this if we just put in very susceptible, very resistant isolates, we will have very nice figures. But if we top load with very, very difficult isolates, the figures won't look that good. So th that can be manipulated by the isolate collection. We do a similar analysis, but not exactly the same. Uh, we do, again, an inhibition zone diameter distribution. We are more um, interested, I think, or we put more emphasis into defining the wild type population. Um, and we then set the zone diameter breakpoint to minimize the number of false susceptible results, similar to CLSI, but we do accept a bit more false resistant results. Another important difference is that we only include an intermediate category if there is an intermediate MIC category and we never use it as a buffer zone. So an intermediate MIC breakpoint is only set if there is a higher dose that can be used. This is an example um, I just chose from our data set and we have all these data available on the UCOS website. Um, this is cefotaxim versus Enterobacteria ACA. The susceptible breakpoint is less than or equal to one milligrams per liter, resistant more than two, and that means that two milligrams per liter is intermediate. It doesn't mean that we don't have an intermediate, but you have to infer it between the numbers uh, of the susceptible and resistant breakpoint. And then again, we have an intermediate category also for the disk diffusion test. And by looking at this data, you can see that this is our susceptible zone diameter breakpoint. We have very few isolates that are false susceptible, but we accept some more isolates that are false, false intermediate or false resistant. So to conclude, what do we do, have to do for groundwork for in vitro testing during drug development? To get to robust MIC data and to reduce patient risk during clinical trials, we have to have standardized reference method. We have to validate AST materials from different manufacturers, make sure that they can be used during those trials. We have to establish quality control criteria. And when we develop zone diameter breakpoints, we also have to try to find the optimal zone size to have a test that is as good as possible and it's also important to use a well-chosen isolate collection for these MIC zone diameter correlation studies. So I do think if anyone has a question, we can take a brief question. We have a few minutes on that. But we are having a round table in a bit just discussing the microbiology and clinical development as well. Um, I do have a question. Oh, go ahead. Right. Erica, uh, thank you very much for reviewing all that. Uh, one of the fundamental premises of new streamlined development for unmet medical need is that there are important pathogens uh, for which we need susceptibility testing to do, make clinical decisions for patients. Uh, but these are the same organisms that may not be captured in routine clinical trials, particularly if the clinical trials are using or collecting wild type organisms. So how does UCAST, uh, are they restricted in what organisms they can set breakpoints for? Uh, or, or can they look at the bigger picture and say, we need to have breakpoints for organism X and Y, even though they weren't captured in the clinical trials? I'm not sure that I am the right person to answer that question. Um, so maybe Gunnar would like to comment instead. <laughs> 
I think also that what, what is uh, um, sent to EMA or and you cost for the clinical MIC breakpoints, that's one thing. Uh, and that's data that you were able to, to put together. But then when it comes to the uh, in vitro part, we can take isolates from wherever just to prove the point and test the method. So that mustn't necessarily be the same isolate collection used. So, hello, that was an excellent presentation, Erica, and thank you very much for the clarity, because I think for a number of years, you know, we've been operating in this new space, trying to understand as UCAST has gained um, their reference methodology and also the DISC method, there has been confusion from drug sponsors as to what time should we come to you, seek guidance, but clearly, you have two that we've seen today, very different perspectives. At CLSI, we start very early in the game because we need a method to take and do our phase three. And we need a reference method for MIC methodology, but we also need a disk. So I'm not quite sure, but I think I heard from your presentation that um, we would come to you for disk methodology post-approval, because it's only at approval by EMA that a drug sponsor would have a UCAST MIC breakpoint. That's correct. Is that correct? Yeah. We don't need uh, any distribution method for the clinical trials, but for the approval. And of course, we, always, we try to aim at publish the MIC and so on the breakpoints at the same time. So at that time, we would like to have the data finished. So one of my concerns and passions at the moment, we had an FDA um, AST workshop last year in September, and we have another one next week. One of the major concerns for drug sponsors is trying to get manufactured discs. Um, and this has proven to be very difficult, in particular in the United States. So many drug sponsors, whether they're in the US or ex-US, are going to European companies. Some of the ones that we use for our early M23 studies, in fact, will never be sold here in the United States. And I raised this concern to the FDA, and I think a lot of people were surprised to even hear that. Um, but, but clearly, the way we derive the, the breakpoints are quite different, because the approaches by the FDA consider the clinical data set. So you're saying your data is derived solely on in vitro data, and you don't use the package that we submit to EMA. Because in the past, we have submitted this data to EMA. The only difference between the two entities is that the disk package, the sound diameters, do not have to be submitted to EMA. It doesn't mean you wait to come to UCAST for starting up the development of the disks. You come as early as you like. And the earlier, the better. The only thing, the only difference, and what you need to remember is that you don't have to hurry to make sure that that data is available in the package that goes to EMA. And we can promise you that unless we run into something very difficult, some really technical difficulties that were impossible to foresee, the disk package and the disk criteria will be there on the day when you start selling the agent. That has never happened, that we haven't been able to meet the disk criteria 
on the day you start selling the, uh, the, the, the agent, except in one specific case where the pseudomonas testing failed completely due to disk problems. So don't worry, it's exactly the same, the only difference is that you don't have to submit the disk package, zone diameters and all that to EMA because they don't care. <laughs> I think that was excellent. I think that'll spark some nice discussion in a bit as well because I do think that clearly knowing how to test early, having all of those QC ranges, et cetera, is what our clinical development programs you know, depend on as well. So next uh, we have Kevin Krauss. He'll be talking about the NDA requirements for a new antibiotic and what the microbiology that surrounds that is. Uh, Kevin is the director of microbiology at Achaeogen. Uh, he's been living the uh, plazomycin program for about three years now, so it's incredibly fresh and uh, maybe a little painful. So I hope that we get a good perspective from that. Thank you, Kevin. All right, thank you for the introduction. Um, as Judith said, my name is Kevin Krauss. I'm the director of microbiology at Achaeogen. Um, which leads me to my disclosures here, which is that I'm an employee and shareholder in Acajan. Um, so I'm absolutely thrilled to be here today, and I'd like to thank the conveners of the session for the opportunity to contribute my thoughts to what I believe has been a very exciting and compelling uh, conference so far. Um, my focus is going to be on three things that are uh, very near and dear to my heart. This is uh, clinical microbiology as it relates to a development program, specifically surveillance programs, clinical trial data, and breakpoints. And one of the things I'm going to be talking about, in addition to just sort of the requirements for each of these, are potential pitfalls to watch out for. So I'll be pulling from my experience over the last uh, almost 19 years of developing drugs to point out places where um, seemingly minor decisions early on can lead to, to very complex problems uh, later. So let's begin with surveillance. Uh, surveillance, uh, I, I want to start by saying that surveillance is a very important investment. For a small company, this can often be a challenge to convince senior management that this is something you really need to invest in, um, in part because uh, one year of surveillance can cost nearly as much as a phase one study. So it's a very substantial investment, but it's really the main way that we are allowed, or that we, we define the spectrum of activity for a molecule. A surveillance program is typically very comprehensive. It focuses on both gram positive and gram negative uh, bacteria. And so you really get a full, a full picture of the spectrum. It also allows you to establish potency against recent clinical isolates, um, those that were collected within the last year, um, and also allows you to compare, to compare your relative potency to other relevant comparators. And by relevant comparators, I mean those that are typically used to treat the species in the clinical environment um, or those that are used in the clinical indication that you're seeking. Uh, we also use this data to identify rates and trends in resistance. So there's an epidemiological aspect, which means that when you design a surveillance program, you need to have robust sampling in places in particular where there are rare resistant phenotypes. So, so for example, in the United States, if you have a drug that's focused on CRE, you need to make sure that you have sites that have an issue with CRE so that you pull those in. Otherwise, you may find yourself at the end of the year having very little data against your target organisms, especially uh, certain resistance types. And then lastly, it provides the opportunity to have access to isolates that are well characterized and that you have data for for your drug. Uh, these can be used to build challenge sets for AST companies, in addition to providing isolates for all sorts of other non-clinical studies. So any in vivo work that you're going to be doing or any other uh, in vitro pharmacodynamic studies. So with that, I highly recommend that you consider starting early. Um, in the past, we would tr traditionally begin surveillance studies as you were thinking about your phase two study or maybe as you were in phase two, and this is when we had traditional development pathways that would take eight to 10 years to bring a drug to market. That's changed substantially today. Um, because of accelerated development pathways, we have molecules coming to market much faster. We've seen at least one example where a drug was uh, proved based on the 505B2 pathway. And that means that a drug from the time you think about entering the clinic to the time it's approved can be three to four years today, at least in the United States. And so that means that you may need to start your surveillance before you start phase one. Um, there are a few examples today where that's exactly what's had to happen. And so thinking about, again, investing a large amount of money before you've invested the money you need for phase one can be, can be a challenge, but it is absolutely necessary to make sure you get the data you need for your filing in the end. Um, but it does need to be recognized that there is financial risk associated with that because you're collecting a lot of data before you have proof of concept for your molecule. 
So there are ways to mitigate those risks through in vitro, or, uh, excuse me, in vivo animal models and other things. But, but it does need to be recognized when you're having conversations with, um, with people about your budgets that that, that is a, a risk that is, should be acknowledged. Um, I also uh, recommend that you design a very comprehensive study. There's a temptation to limit the size of your surveillance study, especially if you have a narrow, a narrow focus of pathogens that you're working on. But I've quoted uh, the FDA guidance, or, or partially quoted the FDA guidance here, that says that, uh, or they recommend that you evaluate activity on the parent molecule, any important metabolites, and, any, and all relevant comparators against at least 500 fresh clinical isolates of each potential pathogen in the intended indication. The fresh clinical isolates in the case of the FDA typically means collected within the previous three years. In Europe, I believe the guidance says within the last five years. But nonetheless, you need to collect a lot of data very quickly as you head towards your regulatory filings. You're also asked to provide isolates with global geographic diversity. So you can't focus on just the United States or just Europe. You really need to have a global perspective on how your drug is performing. And you need to molecularly characterize resistance mechanisms of relevance for those isolates. And I'll, I'll spend a little bit of time on that particular point later. Um, that, that's gotten very complicated as we've moved towards whole genome sequencing. Um, I also recommend that you complete at least three years of global surveillance for your filings. This isn't required, but it's really the only way that you can draw a longitudinal analysis of resistance trends. If you only have one or two years, you're very, uh, it's, you increase the probability that you'll miss something important, uh, and, and particularly when you have emerging resistance um, coming forward. This also allows you to pick up uh, local or clonal outbreaks of something new and emerging. So, for example, in some of the surveillance programs I've worked on in the past, there was a particular resistance type that over four or five years never showed up. There was an outbreak at a site in the United States that was picked up in surveillance, and we were able to look at activity against those isolates. So, highly recommend um, uh, several years of surveillance. So that brings me to potential pitfall number one. So your final surveillance data when you're done and you're filing your, your, fi you're filing your NDA or your MAA is insufficient. This is clearly a possible risk to your regulatory approval. If you don't have enough isolates per guidance, you're, you're unlikely to get approved at least, or you'd get a very limited label. So I recommend that you gain alignment on the study design with the FDA, EMA, or UCAST as early as possible. They're willing to talk to you about this topic. They're very interested in what you're up to. So just, you know, in, in one of your, um, your early regulatory meetings, just describe exactly what you're doing and get them to agree that this would provide sufficient data uh, when you're completing, when you're writing up your regulatory packages. In addition, I recommend that you consider opportunities to supplement with institution-specific studies. There are clearly certain institutions that have uh, more of a resistance problem of a particular type of resistance than others, and it's very reasonable to go to those institutions, find an investigator who's willing to work with you, and have them test your drug against their local isolates. Uh, and that can allow you to augment um, both geographically and against certain resistance types that you don't find in your surveillance. The other part of this pitfall is that there's a missed opportunity for desired label language. Um, the pathogen, the numbers of pathogens you're meant to collect not only inform the uh, labeled pathogens for um, clinical use, but there's also, a, a, at least in the U.S., there's a, a tier two or list two of pathogens that says something like you, there is a great in vitro activity, but no, there's no clinical evidence. That list also depends on activity derived from surveillance. So you may have found that you would have gotten more pathogens in your label on that tier two list if you had done a more comprehensive surveillance program. Um, in addition, we're starting to see claims in labels about in vitro activity against certain resistance uh, elements. These are typically in class resistance. So if you have a beta-lactam, you might have uh, claims in there against uh, ESBLs and, and carbapenemases if it's a BLBLI, for example but that data is dependent on the molecular analysis of the isolates that you conduct. And then finally, your surveillance providers are very, very good at what they do. They do this a lot, they've seen everything, and just collaborate with them and ask them for advice on how to, how to develop a program that suits your needs. Pitfall number two, discordance between your clinical, the isolates observed in your clinical program and your surveillance data. Um, there's a couple ways that you can think about this. One is that you should consider the local epi epidemiology data when available from surveillance when you're picking the sites that you're going to conduct your clinical trials in. Um, it's my personal recommendation, people sometimes do this, but I, wouldn't, I typically would not recommend opening a site in a country or a region that you've never collected surveillance in. Um, you really don't have any good idea about what your drug will do in, in, against the isolates from those regions. 
Um, you can also compare data from clinical trial data sites to global surveillance um, in, in the end when you're done with all your studies. And that really allows you to make sure that you didn't introduce bias into your clinical data sets based on the sites you've selected. Often we find that clinical sites uh, selected for a study cluster in certain regions of the world, and that may lead to bias. Um, and then if you do see differences, can you explain them? Were there local outbreaks in your surveillance that were picked up that are extremely rare that wouldn't be predicted to be seen? <coughs> Excuse me. Um, or are there other sampling issues that, that you can help, that help explain some of the differences that you may see? Okay, on the clinical trial data. So we'll start with study setup, and in particular working with a central lab. So typically you would uh, hire a central lab that does m the majority of the microbiology testing in a semi-independent way for your trials. They'll, run your, they'll do your species identification of all the pathogens collected. They will generate MIC data using pre-made, uh, typically Trek, uh, dry, uh, Trek frozen or dry form panels that have a series of comparators on them. They would run Kirby Bauer disk testing, and they may do molecular characterization for you as well. So a whole wealth of data coming out of this, out of this, uh, this one lab. And then typically, a sponsor would provide a tentative breakpoint to that central lab, and we'll come back to some of the pitfalls with tentative breakpoints later, um, but, but that's one piece of information that sponsors typically employ. Um, okay, and, and so let's talk about those breakpoints a bit. So one way that they're used when you're developing your clinical protocol is to define any exclusions that you're going to put in place in your primary analysis population for resistant isolate subsets. So that can be for your comparator or for your investig investigational agent. Let's say you set a tentative breakpoint of eight mg per liter. You may exclude patients from your final primary analysis that have isolates that have MICs above that. That has to be prospectively defined, though. And um, conversely, for your comparator, you may do the same. You may choose to exclude CRE, for example, or something like that. Um, I would also recommend that, and, and this may seem obvious, but this doesn't always quite work out well, that when you're doing your global regulatory submissions, you, use, you analyze your data using the breakpoints that are appropriate for the country or region that you're applying to. Um, that requires that when you set up those MIC trays that are used by your central lab, that you put thought into the MIC distributions that are, or the MIC ranges that are used on the, or available on that tray uh, so that you have a MIC endpoint that is consistent with the breakpoint for the US, for Europe, for Japan, et cetera. Um, because you're going to need to reanalyze that data before you submit it. Uh, so, for example, in the U.S., we often use CLSI breakpoints when they're available. If they're not available, we may turn to FDA breakpoints. So for Enterobacteria ACA, for example, and Tigacycline, you'd use the FDA breakpoint. There are, some there are some cases where neither is available. So, for example, Calistin with Enterobacteria ACA, and then you'd use UCAS breakpoints. Whereas for EU filings, of course, you'd use uh, UCAS breakpoints. Um, then on to specific clinical microbiology as it relates to the patient's samples. So you need to define what a valid clinical sample is before you begin your study. Um, and there's a lot of flexibility around this, but, um, and there's different approaches to taking it, but there is regulatory guidance available. The trick, though, is that you need to take the regulatory guidance and then inform your decisions based on standard clinical practice. So there might be areas that you'd like to add additional criteria for based on um, what the, the local clinical practice is or based on what the clinical practice is in the regions that you're planning on submitting your, your filings for. Um, some of these include things like uh, a urine sample needs to have greater than or equal to 10 to the fifth CFU per mil at baseline from either a midstream clean catch or a super pubic aspiration with no more than two uropathogens present. <clears throat> That's a pretty standard global definition uh, for what a valid urine sample is. Likewise, for a respiratory sample, uh, a sputum sample in particular, you'd need to have greater than 25 white blood cells and less than 10 squamous cells. And all these things need to be defined ahead of time in your clinical, uh, your clinical protocols. You also need to determine what species of bacteria are going to be labeled pathogens and which are going to be labeled contaminants. Um, you are able to label certain things as contaminants, and they're, they're in a way excluded from the analysis populations. And you can inform those decisions by things like, would the isolate typically be treated in clinical practice? So for the, the, the main example that comes, off, comes up often is enterococcus and urinary tract infections. And how do you handle two isolates of the same species that appear in a single, uh, single sample? Can you show that they're the, actually the same isolate and there's a resistant subpopulation, or are they completely different isolates? Um, so potential pitfall number three. 
logistics of sample transport and testing. And this is something that comes up quite often. Um, it often is a bigger problem in urinary tract infection studies, but, but generally can be a real challenge. Um, when you're doing global studies, you need to look at the microbiology capabilities of your local labs uh, versus available regional labs. So regional labs are labs that might serve a particular region, a particular city, where all the samples can be sent rather than having them processed locally at the site. And you need to weigh the risks of shipping those isolates to a regional lab for local ID and susceptibility testing versus the errors that you're expecting to see from your local site. Um, shipping can be a big challenge depending on which part of the world you're in and depending on what type of sample you're sending. So it's, it's certainly things to consider. If you do use a regional lab, you need to think about the transit time of sampling from the time a, a patient's sample is taken to the time it, is, it arrives at the regional lab. Um, even within the same country, this sometimes can take 48 to 72 hours. So you have to be cognizant of that. Uh, make sure that you have proper shipping containers. Um, is the isolate going to be sent in a van in the middle of summer or in the middle of winter? So make sure that you can accommodate that. Or is it going to be shipped in a plane in a cargo hold that's not temperature controlled? Um, one example to get around this is urine preservative tubes that can be used if you're shipping urine uh, long distances, but not every site wants to use these. They can't be frozen, um, and there are some other issues with them. They're only stable for 48 hours, so things to consider. And then when a, when a study is ongoing, you need to monitor your data as it's coming out in real time. Uh, often you will see discordance between the identification of the species of bacteria locally versus what's seen centrally. And you need to have predefined rules about how to adjudicate that data. Um, so that in some situations, you may just automatically trigger a retest at the central lab. In other situations, you may decide to have the backup isolate from the local site sent to the, to the central lab. And you have to think about how to correct local data entry errors. This happens a lot. Even if you have pull-down menus for a species list, there's almost always a free, t free text field, and you'd be surprised what people will enter in that free text field. Um, some very creative spelling. So you have to figure out how to correct those errors locally so that you're not doing it on the back end when you're, you're pulling your, um, analysis, your data analysis sets together. You also need to look at the tentative breakpoints that you employed in the study and think about whether there's any resistance development emerging in your study. Um, you use the tentative breakpoints, as I said earlier, to define your analysis populations, but you also want to predefine what resistance development looks like, as well as any unusual or unexpected MICs. We often use the greater than fourfold shift in MIC as a potential uh, marker for resistance development, but that may not be relevant if the change in MIC is from 0.06 to 0.25 and your expected breakpoint is 8. So you need to think about how, how all these things fit together. Um, you should also set expert, what we call expert rules at the central lab that automatically flags any unusual MICs and uh, triggers automatic retests of these isolates. Um, Make sure that you're aware of the differences between FDA and UCAS breakpoints and how those can impact data interpretation for comparative agents. And then finally, uh, or, or second to last, prospectively define decision-making algorithms for, pa for pathogen adjudication. You will find that you will spend a lot of time in a very small conference room with a lot of your colleagues going through every single patient, looking at their, their medical history, all of the isolates that were collected, and making decisions about which is the primary pathogen. In order to do that in a non-biased way, you have to document what you've done, and you have to prospectively define the process you're going to employ for that. Um, remember, you're probably or you're very likely going to be audited, and so you have to be able to prove documentation or provide documentation that shows the auditor exactly how you made those decisions and what was done, what was excluded from that patient's analysis, and, and how all that was decided on. And then lastly, as Erica touched on, you need to run QC each day you're doing susceptibility testing um, during a trial. Everything that's tested on a day where a QC value is out of range needs to be retested. Um, all of that data needs to be collected. You need to highlight where, uh, what, which days things were out of range and how they were retested and what the final results were. All of that needs to be pulled together and submitted in with your regulatory filings. So a couple of potential pitfalls. Um, you end up with low availability rates that lead to an underpowered study. There's a couple ways to tackle this. First, you can think about historical trial data to estimate evaluability rates. Um, that can be hit or miss, and, and it's often used early in the planning phases to design the size of the study, but it doesn't always apply um, to a study later. But the best way to get at this is to conduct weekly blinded monitoring of the culture positivity rates in, happening in your study. Um, you can do this globally for the entire study, 
So say you, you need an 80% availability rate in the end, you can keep track of that, uh, how you're performing versus that 80% over time. But you can also look for site level trends, think about opportunities for retraining. You'll often find that a single site may have two, three, four, five patients in a row that are not valuable because uh, there were errors in the microbiology that was taken. So they can be retrained. And you might also consider closing sites that over time just have very low availability rates and are not providing valuable data to your trial. So that brings us to molecular characterization of your isolates. Um, going back 15 or 20 years, we typically would use PCR to look at key defined resistance elements. So the first time I experienced this was on the Televancin program where we were asked to look at PVL rates in MRSA. Uh, and we used a, a PCR-based test for that. We were also asked uh, for some of our, our non-clinical data to separate VAN A versus VAN B VRE because of the activity of Televancin, again, the differential activity against those two subgroups of, of um, isolates. So again, PCR was used there. As time moved on, we began to use off-the-shelf tests for specific things like beta-lactamases. Um, there's, there are several options. The checkpoint system is one I've used in the past that gives you a, a really broad picture of what beta-lactamases are present in an isolate. The problem there, though, is that it doesn't tell you what's not there outside of the things you're specifically looking for. Um, and it also doesn't tell you what is there if you weren't looking for it. So you may have an isolate, uh, an E. coli with a CTXM15, but it may also have you know, fluoroquinolone resistance and other things that are not defined by using these types of tests. Um, it also doesn't allow you to look for point mutations in any resistance elements, which is becoming more and more important as time moves on. So we've begun to move to whole genome sequencing. This has become standard, it's becoming standard practice just in the last few years, but it does create some challenges, uh, which brings us to another pitfall. So number five, so the use of sequencing data in regulatory filings. Um, it's fair to say that the methodology for whole genome sequencing is there, um, or it's largely there. Uh, a lot of this work came out of the viral, antiviral world and has been applied to the antibacterial world. But the guidance on how to interpret the data is still in development. Um, you end up with a tremendous amount of data when you sequence all of your baseline isolates from your clinical study, for example. Um, in a recent study I worked on, we ended up with 600 sequences. It's m many terabytes of data, and there's no uh, specific guidance on how to analyze that data. Nor is there any guidance on how to, how to present that data in a filing. Um, so you can imagine that you can focus on just about any type of resi <laughs> resistance mechanism you want from that data. Um, if you're, again, working on a beta-lactam, you can, you can show all the beta-lactamases, but you show the basis of quinolone resistance, trim sulfur resistance, aminoglycoside resistance, et cetera. Um, you also need to think about how you're going to curate that data for future use. Again, many terabytes of data has a lot of, um, there's a lot of storage needs with that. But you also need to think about how you would, if you had a specific isolate of interest, how you would take that isolate, go find that specific sequence, and marry that data up in the future. There's a temptation to just shove it all into a cloud-based storage system, but you need to be able to mine that data in the future. And then lastly, the data is extremely valuable for research purposes. But there are country-specific privacy laws that prevent us from using the data for other purposes other than the specific aspects of the trial that were predefined. So certainly check your patient consent forms, check your agreements with your regional health authorities, and make sure you're not breaking any laws with your data analysis. And then finally, breakpoints. So what are breakpoints? Uh, I just want to make sure we're, we're all on the same page. Again, this is the formal de definition provided in one of the FDA documents. So breakpoints or interpretive criteria assist in the selection of antibacterial options that are appropriate for treatment of clinical infections. That's the formal definition, at least as the FDA sees it. Um, we derive MIC breakpoints uh, when we consider generally four pieces of data. Your clinical and micro outcomes by MIC from your phase three studies, the probability of PKPD target attainment, uh, your in, any in vivo efficacy data you have, and then your MIC distributions from surveillance. Um, and it's important to note that breakpoints typically are not assigned per indication. They're assigned per pathogen or pathogen group. So you may have studied multiple indications that are very different from each other, but they have a common species, and you will most often get a breakpoint for that species that applies to all the indications. And then disc breakpoints, um, are, as Erica alluded to, are derived from MIC breakpoints with the goal of minimizing error rates. So that often uh, comes a bit later. And how do we use breakpoints? Well, um, they're often, or they're, they're typically interpreted as either susceptible, intermediate, or resistant, or you may see susceptible and non-susceptible. There's, there's different variations of this. Uh, 
but it's typical that SI and R or S and NS is all that's gonna be reported on a typical hospital antibiogram. The end user will generally not see the MIC value. Um, they're, they're almost never reported. It's, and it, these, these um, interpretations then say nothing about relative potency. So if you have three drugs in the same class, you may get an S or I or R for each of those, but we don't ever see how they uh, compare on an MIC basis between each other. Um, and then, so those are, those are the final breakpoints. The provisional breakpoints are set typically based on PKPD prior to phase three. Um, and in, in, in some ways you use your surveillance, the population of MICs in your surveillance to, to guide that. Um, here you're using this data, uh, using these breakpoints to exclude patients from the primary analysis populations in non-inferiority studies. It allows, as I said before, for monitoring of potential resistance development during your clinical program. And importantly, they're used by your automated AST manufacturers. You would provide these tentative breakpoints to the automated AST manufacturers, and they use the, the range around the MIC that you've proposed uh, to, un, to inform the range of drug, uh, drug dilutions that they're going to develop on their system for you. Um, so there is guidance from both the FDA and UCAST on the data that's required for establishing breakpoints. Erica showed uh, some of those guidance documents. Um, the, the first and foremost piece of data that's usually looked at is the clinical and micro outcomes by MIC. Ideally, you would like to see um, outcomes up to the MIC that you are establishing your, as your breakpoint. Unfortunately, this almost never happens. You typically get within a couple of solutions of your theoretical breakpoint. Um, there are a variety of reasons for why that happens. But in those cases, you need to augment your data with PKPD. So that's why I say PTA data is used to supplement the clinical data. Um, you can sometimes use that PKPD data to argue for a higher breakpoint than what the clinical data alone would suggest. Um, and, and that's been successfully done in a number of cases. You can also bring in in vivo data that uses human simulated exposures against isolates with high MICs, the distribution of MICs found in surveillance. And then in the UCAS methodology, we apply the ECOF uh, approach, or basically looking at what the um, MIC population is that is, is associated with wild type versus isolates that fall into class resistance. So I'm showing you two hy completely hypothetical examples here. I totally made this data up, so this isn't related to any one drug. Um, and these types of figures are what is typically shown as the sort of penultimate display in your breakpoint document. In the black, on the histogram there, on the black is your surveillance data. The gray bars are showing the MIC distributions from your phase three program. And then the two curves are the target attainment by MIC for a stasis and a one log kill target. So in both cases, I'm showing the same MIC and surveillance data. Oops. Here, so th this data and this data are identical. Um, and what you see is that in the clinical program, you had MICs up to two. In surveillance, you had MICs up to four. And let's assume for a minute that these MICs up to two in the clinical program were associated with a very high clinical and micro cure rates. Um, so on the left side, the, the development of the breakpoint argument is, is a little more straightforward. You have MICs of two in your clinical program. You do have MICs of four in your MIC distributions. And your target attainment, using a stasis target in this case, but let, let's just say that that's the, that's the focus of your PKPD argument, um, also supports a four. So in this case, you, you would, as a sponsor, propose a breakpoint of four. You have clinical data that supports two, but clearly there are MICs in the four range that are supported by target attainment. That's a little more straightforward. On the right-hand side, however, we have a little bit different example. So again, this data is all the same, but your target attainment supports a breakpoint of 16. So what do you do here? Well, despite that target attainment information, um, you would probably come to the same conclusion. You would still recommend a breakpoint of four because you don't have isolates above the MIC of four uh, existing out in your surveillance program or anywhere that, that's been seen to date. Um, and this, this brings us to our next pitfall, which is that when you're looking at the early PKPD data, it may be tempting to set a tentative breakpoint of 16 or something like that, and that can get you into a bit of trouble uh, later. Because when your tentative breakpoints are too high, a couple things happen. Your patients may not be properly excluded from your primary analysis populations. So if you had set a tentative breakpoint of four, you would have excluded any patients that had isolates with MICs of eight or 16, although we saw that those didn't exist in this case, but that is a risk. Probably the biggest risk, though, is that your automated AST companies have, are very far down the path of developing your drug 
you've spent probably several million dollars in development costs. Um, and when you tell them that your breakpoint is significantly different than what you started out with, they're going to probably tell you that they need to start all over again. And they're also going to tell you that they're not paying for it because you provided them the tentative breakpoints. They asked you multiple times to make sure that that was correct. And you assured them that absolutely you would get the breakpoints that you were proposing. So you start over with cost. You, you get back in the queue and you start over again on the development cycle. And you could end up several years delayed. Um, so again, recommending using PKPD and MIC distributions from, from surveillance to set tenant, realistic tentative breakpoints. So just two, quick more, uh, two more quick points. Um, I wanted to show uh, where all of the culmination of all the work that I just described shows up. And it shows up at least uh, currently <coughs> in, the, in the US in section 12.4 of the package insert in these breakpoint tables. I'm showing you four examples that have different types of breakpoints. Some have just a uh, just as susceptible, uh, excuse me, like Televanson over here has only susceptible. There are some that have SINR and some that have no I, et cetera. So you can sort of see the, the different types of breakpoints here. As we heard yesterday, these breakpoints will be coming out of the label next year and we'll be following more of a UCAS type system where they're available on a website. But nonetheless, all this work leads to basically a number. So, um, so that's where we, where we end. Um, and I just wanted to end by showing three uh, very important resources, two guidance documents from the FDA and the EMA at the top that talk about all of the data that I just described, the very clear guidance on exactly what data you need to have in your filings and how to get it. And then the bottom document is something that came out of a workshop uh, about two years ago that was funded by the EMA where a number of us participated and we talked about how to apply PK and PD principles to drug development. Again, it's a, it's a great document in the end and, and describes a lot of what I just discussed. So, thank you. All right, we'll just take a brief comment or question and then we'll move again forward because we do have 30 minutes in a bit. No, I, I just have a, a comment and I just want to make everyone realize that first of all, just to move back to what we discussed earlier on, there is no such thing as coming to UCAS too early. So just, just to be absolutely sure that there is no misunderstanding. Come early, get the advice, talk to us, sort that out. Number two, you said in EU and that's correct. The problem now is that UCAS yeah. is moving outside the EU, yeah. so we're already Absolutely. in Australia, New Zealand, China, South Africa, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. So you need to think about that as well. Mm -hmm. And number point. three is to alert everyone to the fact that we have a consultation on the UCAS website on the definition of intermediate. Since mm -hmm. you brought that up, I think it's really important that those that feel strongly about intermediate and the usefulness of that uh, go to the UCAS website, go to consultations, and it's until the 15th of September, so you can just about make it. You have nothing to answer. You're good. Thank you very much, Kevin. All right, so for the last speaker for this section, we have Robin Patel from the Mayo Clinic. Uh, she'll be discussing the AST devices, antibacterial test trials versus clinical practice, because again, Kevin can tell you all the things we do to develop, but how does this play out in the lab? Um, Robin is the chair of the Division of Microbiology, the director of the Infectious Disease Laboratory at the Mayo Clinic. Uh, she's a prolific researcher, works with biofilms, resistance, et cetera, and on more committees than I could list, um, and it continues to grow. So thank you, Robin. Thank you, Judith, and, and thank you for inviting me. I'm going to sort of move the discussion a little bit to what goes on in clinical practice uh, with uh, susceptibility testing and try to tie it in really with the pharmaceutical industry and the development of new drugs. Uh, but my perspective, again, will be from uh, the laboratory. These are my disclosures, but I have two additional disclosures because these are just the financial disclosures. First of all, um, if you see an error or if some, in my presentation or if something's not up to date, please correct me um, because I try to do my best to represent what is current today, but this field is changing very, very rapidly. And second, to some of the points that have been made, because I practice in the U.S., a lot of what I'm presenting is very U.S. centric and for that I apologize, um, but feel free to chime in with um, opinions and uh, data from other countries. So I wanted to ask the 
the key question, I think, from my perspective, and try to answer it, why do we need susceptibility testing available in the clinic? And the answer, and it's the same answer as to why we need new drugs, is because of antimicrobial resistance. This is a patient safety issue. So we have patients that are infected with resistant organisms, and to know that they're infected with resistant organisms, we need to perform susceptibility testing. But conversely, we have many, many patients infected with non-resistant organisms, and we need to know that they have a susceptible organism so we don't use some of the drugs that we're breeding resistance to. This is also very important to infection prevention and control. I think that this is not a conference on infection prevention and control, but that is a very important piece when we're talking about antimicrobial resistance, and we need that susceptibility testing to identify patients who harbor resistant organisms so we can contain them and prevent the spread of those organisms. And then obviously for public health, so that we can avoid using overly broad spectrum treatment and breeding resistance, but also th so that we can recognize resistance. So for all of these reasons, in my opinion, accurate and timely susceptibility testing must be performed in clinical laboratories. Probably pretty self-evident, but what do we need? We need methods and we need breakpoints, and that's a little bit of what we've been talking about here today. And we need them. Um, immediately or as soon as possible after a new drug is approved. Um, why is this a new issue? I mean, we've been doing susceptibility testing forever. Uh, is there a new problem? I would propose to you that there is from a susceptibility testing perspective. Just like in the pharmaceutical industry where we're dealing with evolving mechanisms of resistance and different local epidemiology, this is really challenging us in the clinical lab as well. We have a lot of changes in testing recommendations and breakpoints that we have to deal with in the laboratory so that we provide correct results to our clinicians and, and therefore to our patients. We have challenges with MICs straddling breakpoints. So Erica nicely illustrated some of the challenges there. And you can kind of see that organisms that are right around the breakpoints make it really hard for us to deal with. We would much prefer if organisms, and if there are any organisms out there, would just be either susceptible and have MICs here or resistant and be over here, because then we really wouldn't have this big challenge. But a lot of the types of resistance we're dealing with today are right around our breakpoints. And that's really challenging because we're sometimes not sure if they're really susceptible or intermediate or intermediate or resistant. And then um, in some cases, we don't have up-to-date performance data on our commercial AST devices. I'm going to talk more about AST devices. But some of those um, devices may have been developed before a particular type of resistance emerged, and we don't know, therefore, how well they're going to perform with modern uh, types of resistance. Some other new issues. Before 2010, we rarely needed to use our commercial AST systems off-label. So it was an easier time, if you will. Um, we also know there are delays in the availability of FDA cleared tests for our new antimicrobial agents. I can tell you that one of the most frequent questions I take from my clinicians is, why won't the lab provide susceptibility testing for my patient, for their organism, for the drug that I want to use? And what's wrong with the lab? Well, it's not just the lab. We're all in this, and we're all dealing with resistance and the challenges. So that's what I'm trying to highlight. And then we have updated breakpoints, and for good reason. A lot of the old breakpoints were set before, again, we had the types of resistance that we deal with today. And so a lot of different groups, and we'll talk about how that's happening, are resetting breakpoints. But then labs need to adopt those breakpoints, and that's complicated, and I'll talk about that. And we have also a limitation in the US on the use of only FDA breakpoints on commercial AST systems. And that's actually only been in place for the last 10 years, but that poses some challenges to labs as well. And then you've heard about different um, organizations that help with susceptibility testing. We have different breakpoint setting organizations. And there's some challenges to labs with that as well. So what kind of methods do we use in the laboratory? Uh, well, you've heard about DISCs, and you've heard about broth microdilution, but I believe that most laboratories are using some sort of commercial AST device, at, at least in the United States. There are many of these. They're not all listed, but um, entities like Biomeria's Vitec2, Beckman-Coulter's Microscan, BD Phoenix, Thermo Fisher, 
scientific, sensitizer, and so forth. Why are they using those? Because they're easy to use. There's a streamlined workflow, there are objective results uh, measurements, and there's interpretive software. It's a little bit plug and play, and that's really what we need. Um, uh, to uh, provide these results most easily. We also have gradient strips, so E-test, but also uh, LIO, Philcam, MIC test strips, disk diffusion that you heard a lot about, broth microdilution you heard about, agrodilution we haven't talked about, but that's another method that can be used, and then molecular susceptibility as well is another possibility uh, with uh, some caveats that I won't go into great detail on. So. Given that commercial AST systems are commonly used, at least in the US, what are some of the challenges? Um, this is a table that I took out of the CLSI newsletter from June of this year, and I adapted it a little bit. Um, sometimes we don't have updated breakpoints available on our commercial AST systems. The classic example is Enterobacteriaceae and the carbapenems and cephalosporins and that whole story, and I'll talk a little bit about that later on. And, and what are the, what's the impact there? Well, there can be patient safety issues if we're missing identifying uh, resistant organisms, public health issues for the same reason. Sometimes, many times, and I'll show you this data, tests for new drugs are not available on commercial AST devices in a timely manner. So some examples, and there, there are many others, are ceftazidime, avibactam, ceftolazane, tazobactam. And again, we have the same uh, patient safety issue. But I will say um, that that means that a drug could be used without susceptibility testing information, and maybe that's not a good drug for that patient. But we have another issue, at least based on my experience, and that is sometimes clinicians are reluctant to prescribe a drug if they don't have that susceptibility information. And that can mean that a patient is actually being denied a drug that might be benefiting them. It's also obviously of concern to the pharmaceutical uh, industry that just developed and, and launched that drug when the drug doesn't get used. But that, to me, that's really a patient safety issue. Also, a public health issue, uh, missing resistance uh, is raised there. And then sometimes, and this issue was raised in one of the questions, we don't have breakpoints for from the FDA um, for organisms that either weren't included in the clinical trial or that didn't perform reliably the, uh, in that clinical trial. And Many times, new drugs are used off-label, and so clinicians need these breakpoints so that labs can do the testing and report those results to them. Um, and there are other ways of getting at that, but that certainly is a challenge with the, in particular with the commercial AST systems in the US. You heard about breakpoints already, so I'm not going to spend uh, too long on this. We need breakpoints. That's what we, our clinicians use to decide when they're going to use a drug, one of the, the parameters that they look at. And that's really what the lab is, is relying on to report out this test once, of course, we have reliable methods to determine an MIC or a disk diffusion uh, diameter in the first place. In the US, um, the FDA establishes breakpoints, as we've heard with a new drug application, um, or uh, on the request of a pharmaceutical company for older agents. And that's in our package insert. The breakpoints can be found at this website, so I've put a lot of websites in my presentation, and I understand the presentations will be available to you later on. Uh, the FDA, however, can't compel drug manufacturers to revise their breakpoints. It goes the other way. The drug manufacturer has to come back to the FDA and request that change. And for older drugs that really don't have a proponent, that can be a sponsor because it takes a lot of time and money to do this. We've heard about the CLSI. Um, just a comment on the CLSI. It's a multidisciplinary volunteer organization that sets consensus standards. And we've uh, heard about the M23 document as well. So there is a way um, to come up with uh, breakpoints for agents that are not included in package inserts. And that's through the M23 process with the uh, CLSI. And we heard that UCAS has a process for this as well. And why might that be done? It might be done for new resistance mechanisms, uh, drug combinations where there were no breakpoints set, new PKPD data for existing breakpoints, simplification of testing, or harmonization of breakpoints between other breakpoint setting organizations such as UCAST or USCAST. 
Um, and certainly the CLSI spends a lot of time on this. I think there's more work to be done, uh, but uh, this is extremely valuable in clinical practice. For new drugs, the CLSI will, uh, if they agree, publish the same FDA breakpoints for the two years after the drug is approved, and then after that two-year interval can entertain alternative breakpoints if these M23 criteria that I mentioned are met. And the, the breakpoints are published in an M100 standard that's updated annually and available for free. Now, I'm showing this um, slide with some uh, uh, reluctance, but I'm trying to show you the challenges that laboratories deal with when they're looking at breakpoints. We just talked about how important breakpoints are for determining um, whether a clinician will potentially use a drug or not. And I mentioned that there are different breakpoint setting organizations. So here I took a very small set of data uh, with three or four breakpoint setting organizations and just the Enterobacteriaceae and Pseudomonas aeruginosa with certain drugs. And what I just want to show you here, because this is complicated for laboratories to deal with, is there are some drugs like cefotaxime, ceftriaxone, and ertapenem where the breakpoints are all the same across the board. So that's very nice. We can look really at any of these breakpoint setting organizations and we have the same interpretation. But on the other hand, there are other drugs like cefepime, ceftazidime, imipenem, and meropenem for both of these uh, groups of organisms where we have some differences in breakpoints. And that's a little confusing because it means that an organism might be called susceptible or maybe not, depending on what breakpoint you are using, or resistant or maybe not resistant, depending on what breakpoint you're using. So this creates some challenges uh, for laboratories. In addition, and, and again, I'm just uh, presenting the perspective of the laboratory for FDA breakpoints, we need to look at the package insert. We just heard that. And there's actually a nice uh, website that shows all the package inserts. Um, and I was actually looking at it in preparation for this talk, um, just to, to look at some examples and so forth. And I pulled up meropenem breakpoints for Pseudomonas aeruginosa and two different package inserts. And as I'm looking at them, I see that there are different breakpoints in the different package inserts. And this is just really confusing for laboratories when we have this kind of information because the question is, which is the correct one? And if the lab didn't actually look at multiple package inserts, would they really realize that they might be using the wrong breakpoints, um, which could be a patient safety issue at the end of the day. Um, commercial AST systems, as I mentioned, are what are commonly used in US labs. Um, they must be cleared by the US FDA as in vitro diagnostic devices. And they must be used by laboratories according to the manufacturer's instructions that are listed in the FDA cleared package insert. So now we have a second uh, package insert that we're looking at for the device itself. Um, these are cleared through a 510K process. Uh, the manufacturer will document the performance of their system compared to a reference method such as broth microdilution and look at categorical and essential agreement. And I'm going to talk more about this in just a minute. But if there are changes, major changes, like adding a new drug, for example, or revising breakpoints potentially, there may need to be a re-review and re-clearance. And that's a lot of time and money for diagnostics companies to do that. But then, when the commercial AST system is cleared by the FDA and comes into a lab, the work is not over. Each lab that brings in a system has to do quite a lot of work to bring it into the laboratory as well. So what do we have to do in the laboratory? Well, if we're just bringing in an off-the-shelf, FDA-cleared commercial AST system, we still have to show that the test as performed in our lab meets the same performance specifications as those established by the manufacturer, and I'll show you what that looks like. If we're going to modify it, and, and we can modify them, there are additional uh, criteria that must be met, and that requires an extensive study, and I'm going to show you an example of that. In a way, then, we're doing a study that's similar to a study that might be done by a commercial AST device manufacturer to meet clearance of their device with the FDA. So that's even more work. So that's sometimes why labs say we haven't done this kind of study, especially smaller labs. My lab is very, very large. We can do this kind of work. But a small lab in a small hospital may not have the resources to do this kind of work. So if an FDA cleared um, commercial AST system, for example, is coming into the laboratory, what we're going to do is we're going to determine whether the method produces the same results as the manufacturer got. So we're going to take a collection of isolates 
maybe at least 30, ideally many more, and you heard about the challenges of selecting those isolates and how that might actually affect your results. I won't go into all those details. Um, and we need to show that we have comparable performance. We are following CLIA regs for this, but CLIA doesn't actually specify exactly what level of agreement we need. Generally, we're looking for at least 90% essential and categorical agreement, and I'll show you what that means in a minute. And we also have to look at precision or reproducibility by QC testing, and I won't bore you by going into those details of what we would do there. But what if we want to use updated breakpoints? So we have a situation perhaps where um, even the FDA itself has approved new breakpoints, but they're not on the commercial AST system yet, and we want to adopt those FDA cleared breakpoints onto an FDA cleared device that doesn't have the FDA cleared breakpoints. Um, so we can do that, fortunately, because both the Joint Commission and CAP allow us to do that, but we have to establish the performance specifications. And as you heard before, we have to make sure that our commercial AST device actually has those concentrations on it or we can't really do this. But assuming it does, we must again determine whether the results are correct and especially whether they're correct from a categorical agreement. Uh, standpoint. So we might set out to do a study that looks like this. And I just show you this because this is what goes on in the clinical microbiology lab. In every clinical microbiology lab that might want to do this in the U.S., this is a lot of work for us, right? So here's an example. In this study, again, this is made up data, just like you've seen from the other speakers. Uh, we have 100 isolates. We have a gold standard method. So we've had to do all this MIC testing, maybe with a reference broth microdilution standard. Um, and then with our new um, uh, uh, method that we're looking at, these are the breakpoints that we're trying to establish, uh, bring into our lab, so maybe less than or equal to one susceptible to intermediate and greater than or equal to four resistant. And this is how the data lays out. First of all, I point out to you, and you've seen this already from the other speakers, it's not like a perfect world, right? both test systems aren't giving us exactly the same answer. So we're trying to really determine, is this good enough for clinical practice is what we're looking at. So we look at essential agreement, and that is when we line these up, how many of them have exactly the same results. We can tolerate going up or down by one dilution compared to the reference. And so in this case, the essential agreement is 92%. And we'll, I'll comment in a minute if, as to whether that's good enough. And then we look at categorical agreement. So if the, the uh, gold standard method calls it susceptible, is this new method going to call it susceptible or not? And you already heard um, about uh, minor errors, major errors, and very major errors, so I won't re-explain what that is. But in this particular case, I shaded in light gray, which I don't think you can see very well, the minor errors, but then you can see this darker gray color, which is a very major error. And so overall, we have 7% minor errors here and 1% very major errors. And is this good enough? Well, then we turn to a Cumatech document from ASM, uh, that gives us some guidance as to what might be acceptable. And I will say that this just scrapes by as being acceptable. But as mentioned by Erica, if we make this more difficult and we put in more challenging isolates, then we risk failing this. But we do want to put in some challenging isolates because that's the whole point of doing susceptibility testing. So it becomes a little bit complex. Um, and this, again, is what a lab has to do to uh, change a breakpoint on a commercial system that doesn't already have that changed. Okay, so why would we even need to do this? Haven't we caught up with where we need to be with commercial AST systems? So I mentioned earlier that one of the prime examples here is changing breakpoints for the cephalosporins and carbapenems for Enterobacteriaceae and also for Pseudomonas aeruginosa. So just to give you a sort of timeline picture here, um, this is the year the CLSI or this is the CLSI breakpoints and the FDA breakpoints, and you can see they're fairly well harmonized. This is the year the CLSI breakpoint was updated and the year the FDA breakpoint was updated. In preparation for this presentation, I surveyed four uh, commercial manufacturers. Three out of four responded, but for the fourth, I got the information from their website. This is how many that I estimate have updated FDA breakpoints on their commercial, FDA-cleared commercial AST system. So it's all good for ceftriaxone and nirtapenem, but you see for these other compounds, they're not all updated on all of these systems. 
and different labs are using different systems, and there are ways around this, including supplemental ESBL testing and supplemental carbapenemase testing, but you're not, different labs are using different breakpoints, basically, is, is the bottom line. But why? Why would commercial AST system manufacturers not have updated these breakpoints? Why? Because it takes a lot of resources, and it takes away from doing other innovative things. It takes time, it takes money. And so now, it's, it's not really their fault, it's not anybody's fault, it's resistance that's really putting us in this conundrum here. Um, we are behind the times because of this, and we probably need some help. What about new drugs? You knew I was gonna show this as well. Um, not, this is the four commercial AST systems uh, that I mentioned previously, so BD Phoenix, Microscan, Sensititer, and Vitec 2. And I put on here a selection of drugs approved uh, for the past several years. The good news is that for ceftaroline, they're all on, on the commercial AST systems, but if we go um, from 2014 onwards, we don't see any drug that's on all the commercial AST systems. So these are our new drugs. These are the ones that you really want the labs to be testing. We're not talking about changing breakpoints, we're just talking about reporting susceptibility results, and they're not all there. I'm sorry about meropenem vaporbactam. I know that was just approved, and it by no means was gonna show up on a commercial AST system right away. But, you know, uh, just a challenge that we're dealing with. So, what's going on then to solve these problems? Obviously, we have some challenges in the laboratory, but the good news is that we have some initiatives and some recognition of these challenges, and I think we have to work together to try to solve them. So the Presidential Advisory Council on Combating Antibiotic-Resistant Bacteria, or PACCARB, has an advisory council incentives working group that has a draft document out there called the First Report Initial Assessments of the National Action Plan for Combating Antibiotic uh, resistant bacteria, and of course drugs are on there, we know that, but diagnostics are also highlighted as a need. This is still in draft form, so hopefully they don't disappear, uh, but it will apparently be voted on later this month. So what's mentioned in there is that diagnostics inform appropriate antibiotic prescribing, can reduce hospital lengths of stay, prevent hospital admissions, reduce antibiotic use, and benefit society by curtailing antimicrobial resistance. However, there are barriers to diagnostics. The cost of development, lack of clinical implementation of approved tests, um, that's interesting, uh, we'll come back to that. Inadequate reimbursement, also interesting and a challenge for us, and expensive and complex regulatory processes. And they specifically highlight, number one on their list, AST devices for new antibiotics as being um, uh, something that we need to work on, as well as tests that provide rapid susceptibility testing. They also uh, highlighted economic, uh, what they call issues, R&D issues, regulatory issues, and interestingly, behavioral issues as well, uh, as concerns antimicrobial resistance and diagnostics. And um, I'm gonna show you the details on this economic issue number one, because economic issue number one was there is a delay in availability of ASTs for newly approved antibiotics, which I just talked about about five times over. But they have a proposal for a solution that I would agree with. Availability of an e-test or a disc when the antibiotic is approved would greatly improve the ability of laboratories to provide critical information. This seems so simple, but I agree with it, and hopefully that will be in the final document, it's in the draft document. Also, they highlight a number of other economic, R&D, regulatory, and behavioral issues that are, I think are interesting uh, to look at. Uh, reimbursement is not aligned with value of diagnostic tests. So I just explained to you all of the work that labs have to do to implement some of these tests. The reimbursement for uh, this, well, there's no reimbursement for that implementation, and even the reimbursement for having um, for performing some of this testing is, is really not aligned at all with what it really takes the lab uh, to do it. There's a lack of a clinical and economic outcome studies showing that diagnostic tests prevent emergence of antibiotic resistant bacteria. This is not so much about susceptibility testing, but uh, certainly an issue. The high cost of development, this is an issue for diagnostics companies. Tests are needed to provide rapid susceptibility test uh, results. Collaboration is needed between diagnostics companies and other stakeholders. The regulatory approval process is highlighted as well um, as being time consuming and costly. And th these two are very interesting. There are no requirements to hospitals to update their microbiology labs with newer technologies or to adopt these new breakpoints. Um, 
or to offer susceptibility testing for new drugs. This is also interesting and something to, to think about. And then a behavioral issue. Clinicians don't always use diagnostic tests, believe the results, or act on them. Also another issue that was interesting that they highlighted. Okay, another, um, I think, uh, important uh, document is this document from the FDA that's draft guidance for industry and FDA staff, the coordinated development of antimicrobial drugs and commercial AST devices. We heard something about this when we were talking about when are we developing disks and so forth, but I would say we need uh, susceptibility testing methods and breakpoints as early as possible so that we have something available for labs immediately, but so that we get commercial AST devices uh, to labs as soon as possible after drugs are approved. So this is a nice document to read that uh, speaks to the coordinated development of products in terms of developing the commercial AST devices kind of alongside the new drugs. So again, that they're available immediately or shortly thereafter. The FDA, I won't read all of this, is not considering this a companion diagnostic, but still a required uh, or a, an ideal test to have developed alongside the drug. This requires working together with AST device manufacturers, and as I mentioned, there are many of them, which I'm sure you know, um, submitting coordinated development plans um, to CEDAR and CDRH for review and comment. Uh, they do comment that this is probably not going to require an investigational device exemption, but maybe there are scenarios where that might be required if you're using this to enroll into clinical trials and so forth, so that's not completely clear. And um, throughout the process, there would be communication between CDRH and CEDAR, but at the end of the day, each would make independent de decisions on approval of the drug and approval of the device. Um, there was a letter uh, from AvaMed, which is the Advanced Medical Technology Association representing uh, some of the device folks, uh, with some concern about this, and it's the same concern that Kevin kind of raised, that if during the process of the, the new drug application, the, the clinical trials and so forth, the breakpoints change, and the device has already been developed, uh, there may need to be a lot of rework on the part of the diagnostic company, and that can be a real challenge. So they propose two solutions that are uh, interesting to look at. That we recommend that the FDA consider granting clearance based on essential agreement and not categorical agreement. Um, I don't know if that would work, and that might pose challenges to labs at the end of the day. Or, and this really makes sense, that breakpoints and claimed organisms are reviewed early earlier in the drug approval process so that they're set earlier and so the commercial AST device manufacturers can look at that. Some other advances, we have more collections of organisms that are available both to um, pharmaceutical industry as well as to labs. The FDA CDC antimicrobial resistance isolate bank is one. If you go into this website, you can see some nice collections of organisms that you can gain access to uh, to, uh, to interrogate systems or to validate and verify tests in clinical labs. The ARLG, Antibacterial Resistance Leadership Group, has a nice collection of organisms, and there are other collections available as well. We've heard about the 21st Century Cures Act, and we've heard about what this means. So just to reiterate, um, this will allow the FDA to recognize breakpoints established by breakpoint setting organizations. We don't know which one or ones will be recognized, but this is really promising because now we can have breakpoints that are outside of what's in just that package insert. They'll move to a website by the end of this year uh, that is established by the FDA and updated at a minimum every six months, and they'll move out of the package insert. And again, this is good because the breakpoints will no longer be associated specifically with the indications for use and presumably can therefore be more broad and more useful in clinical practice. Another initiative uh, which is sort of mix, met with mixed reviews for providing uh, susceptibility testing is pharmaceutical company supported reference laboratories. Many companies have tried this uh, to offer susceptibility testing when clinical labs can't do it. Unfortunately, this can result in reporting delays because the isolates have to go to this reference lab. But also there can be limitations on what kind of isolates get tested in terms of 
of being from specimens consistent with FDA indications. And as I mentioned before, a lot of times drugs are used off-label, so they don't meet these criteria. And then there are concerns about compliance with the Sunshine Act if free of charge susceptibility testing is construed as a kickback to prescribing the company's drug. So in conclusion, and hopefully I've made this point, we need accurate and timely susceptibility testing performed in clinical laboratories, and we need it more so today than ever before so that we can use the right drugs on the right patients. But this requires are having reliable methods and breakpoints as well. There are many challenges. They are financial, scientific, regulatory, and we also have different breakpoint setting organizations with some differences there. But we know and we've heard that there is fast tracking for pharmaceutical companies. There is less fast tracking for device manufacturers, but I would submit that we maybe need to, to move in that direction so we can get the testing available to use the drugs that are now being delivered to clinical practice. Fortunately, there are a lot of initiatives that I've highlighted, the PACCARB Advisory Council Incentives Working Group, the FDA's coordinated development of antimicrobial drugs and AST devices, the isolate banks and collections that I've talked about, and finally, the 21st Century Cures Act. So thank you for your attention. Thank you. That was excellent. So now we're going to have our round table. So I think all the speakers will come up. And if people want to get their questions together, just to look into what the pitfalls are, what some of the you know, questions from development. Um, again, we've got everybody covered here, pharmaceutical as well as government and, and uh, academic as well. Jeff Loud at Medicines Company. A really nice set of talks, really impressive. Uh, Kevin, my question is directed at you. Um, uh, I really liked your set of pitfalls related to clinical trials. Not every company has a Kevin Krauss, though, and not every company has an Olga Lomovskaya, uh, who can bridge that uh, microbiology science side to the clinical trial microbiology. And so when we're doing those trials, we're often looking at contract research organizations to help us. Can you comment on uh, the abilities of those CROs, the, the range of abilities you've seen as CROs to help small companies in this area? Yeah, yeah thanks, Jeff. That's a great question. Um, I think we've seen over the last five to 10 years that the CROs have been playing this role more and more and getting more and more expertise in the space. So I certainly think that's, that's one option to at least begin to address some of the challenges. Um, and, and there are certainly other consultants out there who have done a lot of this that, that can help as well. But I think you know, probably a blend of working with several different CROs who can help you with this and finding some experts who are, who are consulting right now um, is the best approach. Sandra McCurdy, Melinda Therapeutics. Uh, you asked for a correction, and we do have two other susceptibility testing devices available for delafloxacin. We have a disc, and we have the Theophilchem MTS strip. But um, I do have a question for you, and uh, the question is about the verification process once we do get these devices in the laboratory. I would like to know, it seems like it's an extensive verification, but I would like to know when you're thinking about the discs, the strips, or the sensitizer panels, the, I don't really want to know about the automated devices at this point, but I'd like to know how often you actually find a problem. Yeah, so first of all, thank you for your clarification. And just so I can clarify, I was just looking at commercial AST devices, so I didn't count discs and strips uh, in my math. Uh, but you're right, um, those, those are available. So thank you for clarifying that. So I can tell you that it's a challenge. So here, we're a, I'm a lab director. You're looking at something that's been cleared by the FDA, and you're verifying the performance in your lab. And what if it doesn't meet the performance characteristics that were already established by the manufacturer and cleared by the FDA? What do you do about that? We're following CLIA regulations to do this, and it does happen. So what we have to do is troubleshoot at that point. We have to figure out 
what went wrong. And a lot of times that's repeating it, looking at whether where errors were made, documenting that. Um, and potentially making the study a larger study. So one of the issues you can run into is you ran too small a study and, and the criteria for meeting acceptability are pretty stringent and you need to look at a larger collection of organisms. You can, however, end up in a situation where you expand your study, you repeat, and you still don't meet acceptance criteria. And there can be situations then where you just can't adopt it into the laboratory. And that certainly does happen. And it happens with even non-AST devices. It can happen with other test systems as well. Um, I, I, can, I can tell you that I have had to take tests down that aren't performing as they should be performing as cleared by the FDA in my laboratory. Uh, that's the reason, I think, why we have to do those verifications. But it is very frustrating and a lot of work for labs when that happens. Um, a lot of times we can, we can figure out a way of making it work. Maybe it's for a particular organism type and we just can't do testing for that organism type. Uh, maybe we need to, uh, again, as I mentioned, increase the size of the study, repeat it and so forth and we can, we can eventually get it to work. But I, I can say it does happen and it is very frustrating. Linda Miller from um, CMID Pharma Consulting. Um, Robin, I have a question for you. Um, you mentioned that you, if you want to use FDA or UCAS CLSI breakpoints or UCAS breakpoints, you have to go, essentially go through the same process that the AST manufacturer would have to go through. So my question is, just thinking on a small scale, if you run a lab and you have two of the same device, say, at two different sites. Let's say your lab has two locations. Can you do that study once, and then can it cover both? Or do you have to do this study on each instrument? We're, we're picking in the weeds at yeah. American regulations. So for the non-US people, you can just you know look at your phones for a minute. Um, <laughs> if, you're, if you have a different CLIA uh, uh, number, I think you have to do it at every site. Okay. Because I was hoping that, I guess, say, you could get, we could get ARLG or somebody to do that study or fund that study. And because when the manufacturer does it, when they do it, doesn't it apply to all of the devices? We have to do this for any test that comes into yeah. the laboratory, really. It's, it's a regulatory requirement. And it, it does make sense that the test that's performed in the lab um, be verified to meet the criteria that it's supposed to meet in the laboratory. And it has to be done in each laboratory. So many times you're dealing with health systems, at least in the US, where you have a lot of different hospitals that are affiliated with each other and that may actually be doing the same things and reporting on the same platforms, but they each need to verify at their independent site. Right, but you mentioned two levels of verification right, the smaller test and then the bigger test. So it, I'm just thinking about that bigger for both, testing. For both of them. Okay. Yes. Thank you. All right, I have a question. Is that working? So I'll start with you. What do you wish developers would do earlier? Developers of new agents or? I mean, from our perspective, as Gunnar po pointed out before, it's very good if you contact us early. And we have now, I could say, a number of beta-lactam, beta-lactamase inhibitor combinations being developed, uh, and that is difficult. Um, and it's good to contact us to discuss also the reference method for the MIT testing, how that should be done. Um, this is something that uh, UCOST is discussing, and we will publish a document, maybe not with a very clear solution, but at least with our thoughts on how those uh, agents should be tested. So that's one thing. Uh, and um, also for the disk diffusion test, of course, it's always good to contact us uh, as early as possible. And we don't develop disks with lower potency because we think it's uh, fun. We do it because we think uh, are convinced that we will have a better test. Uh, but of course, we are interested in streamlining this and have a good test for, for the agent with only one disk load for the whole world. I have just one comment. I think a good lab director makes sure that his or her lab can do disk testing. <laughs>
at an appropriate level with the stuff you need. You know, you need to train your staff, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, because that's what you're going to fall back on when all the others fail. And remember, the gradient tests fail as well. So can I just follow up on that too for both Robin and Kevin? When it comes, what is the impact of a serious decline in people training in clinical micro as far as getting individuals who, who one, can do the lab work that we're asking them to do and it's only going to get more complicated, especially for successful getting diagnostics, right? That, that would be fabulous if we can get rapid diagnostics. So are you feeling the impact now? How does that future look? And same to you, Kevin, from you know, your space. So I personally, I, I don't understand why people wouldn't train in microbiology and you probably <laughs> think the same way. Um, I think it's a great field. I think we're going to need more people in, in that uh, area. But I think you're kind of talking about two things. Um, for clinical patient care, we need these results. We need them quickly, reproducibly, accurately. And there is a need for better diagnostics and more rapid diagnostics so we can deliver this. And many of those are, are going to be dumbed down from the standpoint of the user. And that's actually a good thing. They're standardized, they're hard to do wrong, and so forth. But at, at the other end, as Gunnar pointed out, we need capable, competent people who can do sophisticated testing to care for our patients, and we need to train people to be able to do that. We need to make it clear that it is an exciting field to go into, because I think it is, and there's some interesting differences, I think, between Europe and the U.S. in that regard, too. It doesn't seem to be a problem recruiting people into microbiology in, uh, in Europe. Maybe it is a little bit more so in, in the U.S., so I think we just need to make people aware that it's an exciting profession. Yeah, and I, I would just echo that. I think um, from the pharma perspective, it's very difficult to find people that will do this type of work. I've had two positions open. One took 18 months to fill, and I had almost no one apply to it that had, had relevant experience, and I've had one open for, for nearly a year. Um, and I think one of the challenges is that clinical microbiology encompasses a lot of different things in the pharma side. It's not just running a clinical trial. It's also managing a whole bunch of non-clinical work. So you have to be able to set up and manage and interpret in vivo data. You have to understand PKPD, you have to be able to design all the in vitro work, you have to run a clinical trial, you have to develop AST devices, and you have to be able to go stand up at an ad com and defend all this. So finding people that can, that can do all this is a challenge, and um, I think if we're going to fix the issue of not enough drugs coming through the system, we're going to see more companies come into the space, and it's going to be harder and harder to find people that can, that can do all this work. John Rex, uh, so thank you for great talks. and. I want to ask if we're missing collectively an opportunity to frame this problem in a way that would be, uh, provides a different conversation. And I'm thinking about risk. And yesterday we talked about how with the drug approval, we have moved toward allowing uh, packages that are smaller, which means actually we know less, which means there's more risk in the drug when it gets approved because there is a need to move it along more promptly to address a specific unmet need. And when you think about devices and susceptibility testing, you know, I think I grew up thinking about it as, you know, it's sort of a numbers game, a math game. You have to you know, get your accuracy within X and Y. And, and, and you didn't even talk about updating molecular diagnostic tests, where I understand that, you know, you can have an approved test that, that PCRs for these three genes, but you, you discover another polymorphism and you want to change it, and you kind of like you have to start all over again, in a sense. You know, you know don't, I don't do devices professionally, but that's the sense that I have. And, and our framework there has been about accuracy and you know, perfection. And should we be talking more deliberately about being willing to accept a certain level of risk in exchange for having access to potentially imperfect, but maybe it's not that imperfect, you know, it's a level of risk. And so I'm really kind of looking at Robin to think out loud about this because I want you to integrate your, your, your medic hat with your clinical microbiologist hat and your patient care hat and tell us, you know, where should the balance be here and is there a different argument to be had or, and has this argument been made and I just, I just missed it? Really good points, of course. Um, I don't disagree with you. 
Um, and I'm no expert on regulatory issues, but it does come back to that. So the way that many of these tests are used and approved in the US is different from how they're used and approved in Europe. And I think you have to look at a risk benefit um, equation like you bring up. Um, it all comes back to resistance, though, when we're talking about the topic at hand here. And we have a field that's changing rapidly. We need to be able to adapt and be flexible with our diagnostics. And we really de do need to look at whether our regulatory environment provides the, the possibility of doing that and therefore doing the right thing for our patients. Okay. Anybody else on that theme? I mean, I, I think it's an interesting one to, to really meditate on because we are going to have a conversation next week. Uh, at the FDA, 13 September, about devices, and and we've all we've all been frustrated by this problem, and and we may be letting the merely good, letting the perfect be the obstacle in the, in the way of the merely good. And so, so thanks. I think that as we increase the risk on the pharma side we shouldn't increase it on the testing side. But we need to do what we're doing now smarter and in a smarter way. But I think that we should continue to insist that what we put out from the lab needs to be right. And whether it needs to be right in 95% of the time or 99% of the time, we can discuss that. But I think we need to uphold a quality in the testing procedure and in what we're putting out to be able to accept a risk on the other side. Couldn't agree more. Sorry, yeah, so there's no more questions. We will all be around for lunch. Uh, <laughs> so thank you guys. <laughs>